Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I will do a check with um, IT. Michelle, are we, we are now live? All is good, yes. All right, very good. Good morning. I am calling the public work study regarding docket number 21-EKME-088-GIE to order. My name is Susan Duffy. I am the chair of the Kansas Corporation Commission. Joining me are my two colleagues, Commissioners Dwight D. Keene and Commissioner Andrew J. French. Uh, if you would like to say a brief hello, Commissioner Keene, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this, is, this is one in a series of really important work studies. Um, obviously, what, we're, what we do here, at, in, in essence, to me, is focus on uh, strategic planning by Evergy and the related impact that that has on ratepayers. I think through um, the public and the broader scope of stakeholder involvement here, we have really an important way to <clears throat> increase public awareness through this level of transparency. So I would certainly join my fellow commissioners here in uh, <clears throat> uh, expressing the fact that we're pleased with the public involvement in this, uh, in this effort. And we certainly appreciate Evergy's willingness to give uh, and provide us with this information <clears throat> and their insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Keene and Commissioner French. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll just echo all of uh, Commissioner Keene's comments and just say how happy I am uh, that, that you all are here to discuss this. And I, I really could not be any happier <laughs> with this process that we've come up with and, and our ability to, to push this out to the public uh, over YouTube. I, I, I think it's fantastic uh, that everybody gets to see this dialogue and, and commend everybody for participating. So looking forward to today, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, French. Uh, currently, we actually have 54 participants and I don't know how many are on our other live streaming. Um, as Commissioner Keene uh, alluded earlier, this is the second of four scheduled work studies to discuss Evergy Sustainability Transformation Plan, and we refer to it as the STP. This work study will focus on operational deficiencies, efficiencies, I'm sorry, included in the STP. The commission believes this work study is very important to allow both the commission and the public to learn more about Evergy's proposed STP. We look forward to learning more about the plan and the opportunity to ask questions. Other participants who have been granted intervention in the docket will also have the opportunity to ask questions. Due to the pandemic, we are conducting this work study by Zoom and broadcasting to the public on YouTube. Please bear with us if you experience uh, any technical issues. Uh, we plan to take a half hour lunch break uh, between 12.30 and 1.30. We also will be taking um, short five minute breaks about every 90 minutes. At this time, I would like to welcome everybody. I do appreciate the uh, effort that folks have put into um, this work study. It is very valuable to us to learn, but not just learn as a commission, to learn as an industry and the public. I will now turn the proceeding over to the Commission's General Counsel, Brian Fedoten, who will be moderating today's work study. Brian. Yes, thank you, Chair Duffy. Uh, let's begin with a roll call of the interveners. Uh, when I call on you, please introduce yourself for the record. Evergy. Good morning, Kathy Dingus here for Evergy. Um, Greg Greenwood will introduce the rest of our speakers uh, here in a little bit. Thank you. Curb. Dave Nickel on behalf of CURB. We have joining us today, Andrea Crane, uh, Josh France, Patrick Orr, Todd Love, and Joseph A. Strab. Thank you. Thank you. Climate and Energy Project. Yes, this is Tim Laughlin with uh, Climate and Energy Project. And today we have with us um, Dorothy Barnett, who's the Executive Director. Thank you. Grain Belt Express. Hi, this is uh, Andrew Schulte representing Grain Belt Express. I'm with Wilson LA Law Firm in Kansas City. 
Also on the line today is Nicole Lucky, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Invenergy, the uh, um, a parent company of Greenbelt Express, and uh, Orjit Goshal, um, who is the Director of Regulatory Affairs uh, for Invenergy. Okay, thank you. Uh, the local 304. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Wood. I am the attorney for IBEW Local 304, and I'll be the loan representative for that uh, organization on this call today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Midwest Energy. Uh, good morning. Ann Kallenbach, uh, appearing on behalf of Midwest Energy, and I believe that uh, Tom Mice is on the line. Um, if not, he should be joining shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Commission staff. Good morning, Terry Pemberton. Um, on behalf of Commission staff, I'm joined by Michael Neely, who's Senior Litigation Counsel, and a whole slew of folks. I've got Jeff McClanahan, Direct Director of our Utilities Division, Justin Grady, Chief of Revenue Requirements, Cost of Service and Finance, Adam Gatewood, Senior Managing Financial Analyst, Leo Hanos, our Chief Engineer, and Tim Stringer, Utility Engineer. Thanks. Thank you. Kepco. Capco. Okay. Uh, KIC. Good morning, Brian. Robert Vincent for KIC. Joining us on the call today are Jim Zakura and Connor Thompson, also with the law firm of Smith Min and Zakura Charter. Thank you. Uh, Kansas Power Pool. Good morning. Amy Klein here for Kansas Power Pool. I'm also joined by the Power Pool's Associate General Manager, Larry Holloway. Thank you. McPherson Board of Public Utilities. Good morning. This is Heather Starnes of Healy Law Offices on behalf of McPherson Board of Public Utilities. I also have participating Tim Meyer and Josh Badel, the General Manager and Assistant General Manager of McPherson Board of Public Utilities. Thank you. Thank you. Natural Resource Defense Council. Yeah, good morning, Brian. Um, Thomas Connors appears on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, we're also joined by Ashok Gupta, who is a senior economist for uh, NRDC. Thank you. Sierra Club. Teresa Woody, Kansas Sappleseed, representing Sierra Club. And we're going to be joined by Ty Gorman, Kansas representative for the Sierra Club. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, USD number 259. Good morning. Amy Klein here. I'm pulling some double duty today. I'm representing uh, USD 259. We're also joined by uh, one of our experts, David Banks. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone on the, the line or any parties that were not called on in the roll call? Yes, Kep this is Rebecca Fowler, Manager of Regulatory Affairs at KEPCO. We have Mark Doljak, uh, Executive Director of Regulatory Affairs, Kimberly Frank, Outside Counsel, and Susan Cunningham, Vice President and General Counsel of KEPCO. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. There may be some confidential information discussed today. If so, we'll save that information for the end of the work session. Uh, pursuant to KSA 75-4319B4 of the Kansas Open Meetings Act, which allows the commission to conduct a closed session to discuss data related to financial affairs or trade secrets of corporations. If there is confidential information to be discussed, we will go into a closed session. Uh, individuals affiliated with, with the interveners who have signed and submitted a non-disclosure agreement are permitted to attend the closed session. Members of the general public viewing the live stream on our YouTube channel will not be able to participate in any closed session. Um, with that, we'll begin with a presentation from Evergy. Uh, the presenters will be Greg Greenwood and John Grace. Following Evergy's presentation, the commissioners will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, after the commissioners ask their questions, I will call on the interveners in alphabetical order. When called on, please introduce yourself, present your technical experts who will be asking questions and comments and um, please, for the record, if the commenters could identify themselves by name and title uh, before making their questions and comments. 
after the interveners questions and comments, um, Evergy will provide some follow up to some outstanding questions from the first workshop, uh, including an overview of expenditures by state, rate impacts by jurisdiction, layout of the capital plan views, uh, transmission spend, um, percentage of transmission and distribution systems to be included in the plan, um, SDP outputs, metrics, and measures under consideration in capacity versus energy mix. Uh, at the conclusion of Evergy's update, again, we may go into a closed session to discuss any confidential information. Um, with that, I think we're, we're um, ready to begin. So Mr. Greenwood, would you like to introduce um, Evergy's panel? Yeah, I'd be glad to, Brian. Thank you. And, and my role at Evergy is I'm the chief administrative officer for the for the company. So thank you for joining us for this second work study to discuss operational efficiency aspects of the STP. Can you hear me okay before I get going too far? Okay, thank you. John Grace, our director of corporate planning and financial performance, will join me in delivering our prepared remarks. As you can imagine, operational efficiencies span the entire organization, so we have several other Evergy employees available to help answer questions if needed. Some of those employees will likely include Kevin Bryant, our Chief Operating Officer, Bruce Aiken, our VP of Transmission and Distribution, and as you'll all recall, those two uh, uh, led work study number one. Also available, Kevin Bryant or Kevin Noblet, Vice President of Safety and Operations Planning, John Britson, our Vice President of Generation, uh, Darren Ives, who you all know, our Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Mike Meyer, Senior Director of Financial Analysis, and Terry Thomas, Director of Financial Performance. And believe it or not, we have a few other subject matter experts for different parts of the business that we can call upon. Um, if needed, and all of those folks will identify themselves uh, if and when they speak. Uh, as Brian said, if your questions relate to confidential information, we'll ask that we defer those uh, toward the end of the meeting. Um, also, um, as Brian mentioned, uh, we will save the last 30 minutes of this session to respond verbally and give an update on the handful of items that Brian listed that are outstanding from work study number one. So with that, let's get started. So on slide two, and are the slides up? Can people see the slides? Oh, here we go. Perfect, thank you. And first of all, a little bit about, about me. I've been with Evergy for more than 27 years. Um, had the pleasure to work uh, in a variety of areas in my time at Evergy, from accounting and finance to major construction, customer care, IT, environmental, and, and other areas. Also, a, a significant amount of time in regulatory affairs, have, as many of you are aware. Uh, my current responsibilities, in addition to regulatory affairs, include supply chain, enterprise analytics, and continuous improvement functions. So here's how we plan to go through things with you today. First, I'll talk through an overview of the full STP, then discuss benchmarking and our cost structure as an overview of how we went about identifying and documenting savings opportunities, the program management structure that we've created, then overview the expectations for fuel, purchase power, and operating savings that are included in the STP. Then John Grace will introduce himself and he'll talk through our savings expectations by a major area with discussions of some of the major contributors in each of those areas from across the company. Lastly, John, John will walk through a single example of an efficiency idea, what it is, and the steps that are needed to get it to the finish line. Then we'll take your questions and Mr. Fredoten will direct traffic regarding the parties and the commission uh, for that phase. And due to the number of Evergy employees that we may need to engage depending on the questions, I'll attempt to manage the Q&A from the Evergy perspective. Okay, so moving to slide four. The STP is a balanced strategic plan that begins with maintaining our merger commitments that we made more than two and a half years ago when we formed Evergy. 
uh, in invest in infrastructure. Uh, we had a significant discussion about infrastructure investment in the December 3rd work study. That investment uh, reduces ongoing operating costs and or it modernizes the grid to maintain and enhance reliability for customers and it enables larger amounts of clean energy delivery. Evergy produces clean energy to meet almost 50% of our retail customer needs. And in fact, this year, year to date, it's over 55%. And while we're a leader in clean energy, customers in Kansas, Missouri, and, and across the country are demanding even more clean energy. And we're here to meet those expectations and it can be done while still staying mindful of customer bills at the same time. When all of this is executed properly, not only will customers get cleaner, more modern and reliable electric system, they'll enable a large local company to remain local by meeting investor expectations. Turning to slide five, this slide is, is similar to the previous slide, but with much more detail. And I'll just draw your attention to a few items here. The focus of this work study, as you know, is cost efficiency. The STP expects a 25% reduction in non-fuel related uh, operating costs by 2024 from 2018 levels. Another expectation is the results of the STP on customer bills will be increases that are less than anticipated inflation and allow our retail costs to gain ground on the region. These investments will grow net direct and indirect jobs and make our communities more attractive for, for potential new and expanding businesses. Lastly, meeting customer demands for cleaner energy sources will require a more robust transmission and distribution system to manage larger volumes of clean energy production, whether that's our own production or, or that of our customers. With collaborative work to manage the remaining investment in our legacy assets, we can increase our clean energy production from the 50% today to more than 80%, uh, maybe by as soon as 2030. Now on slide six, this slide shows where we are in the series of planned work studies and our focus today on cost efficiency. I'll remind you, the, I'll remind the commission and parties that we continue to conduct engagement on the integrated resource plan, including our most recent discussions just last Friday. The next work study is related to co customer experiences and is planned for January 20th. And Chuck Kaisley, our Senior Vice President of Marketing and Public Affairs will, will lead us through that, that session. Okay, let's move to slide eight. Now this is, this is an interesting look at the rate impacts expected from 2018 to 2024 for Evergy in total. The very top line of this colorful rectangle in the middle of the page represents the increase expected in overall customer bills. As a side note, another tool that we have once had available to help manage customer bill impacts for decades that has largely disappeared is customer demand growth. For the first 15 years of my, my career in this industry, we had about one and a half percent, some years even 2% sales growth. That growth was able to offset three and a half percent of operating cost growth and still keep customer bills flat. Though we complained back at the time that these this meager growth, uh, we now call those the good old days because uh, our sales growth today is about one half of 1%, um, and it has been for the last several years and looks to be in the future. So back to this slide, while the components that make up the bill change a fair amount, as you can see, due to investments in modernizing the grid and related generation resources, uh, those investments are shown in blue on the chart. We also expect significant fuel purchase power and operating savings that are shown in gray. Uh, and the, the, the gray components of this stack bar. Those operational efficiencies in gray are what we'll focus on and go more deeply in today. The effect pictured on this slide aligns with much that you've already heard from us 
and is going on across the country. Utilities with customers that have benefited over the past decades from base load fossil generation and from utilization of grid investments made decades ago are, are now in the process of transitioning the grid and supply portfolio to refresh aging systems, adding resilience and modern technology, much of what we discussed in, in work study number one. Moving to slide nine, this slide shows the STPs sharpens our cost structure while maintaining system reliability. This chart might be the most important slide in the entire discussion today. So if you only remember one, uh, this is it. Here we benchmark Ever Evergy's operating cost structure to our industry over time. Be beginning with the year the, of the merger, uh, with very little merger related savings achieved at the time and ending with our expectations for operating costs in 2024. Now we all know benchmarking is an inexact science, but we also know it can be helpful in identifying the areas to look for uh, more deeply for improvements. And that's just what we've done. The benchmarking results, which was an early step of the STP process shows 2018 energy cost structure at mid to high third quartile with fourth quartile being the worst. Now, please give us a little break here as we, had, we hadn't even begun to realize much of the merge, merger savings available to us back in 2018. Um, the merger didn't close until mid that year. 2019 shows some improvement at, as we completed our first full year as Evergy and began to realize merger related savings. The result is an improvement to low to mid third quartile. From 2019 through 2024, we expect cost improvements through execution of the STP of over $300 million a year, both fuel and non-fuel, which when allowing for inflation lands us in the lower half of the second quartile cost performance, a pretty significant cost improvement, I would say. So what I hope you take away from this slide the premise of the merger was to get larger and gain the economies of scale that are available in our industry. We are down the road in achieving that reality and well ahead of plan in achieving merger related savings. But we found additional opportunity exists to get leaner while focusing spending in areas that ensure that we are maintaining long-term system integrity and reliability. This chart on slide 10 shows the process of identifying efficiency ideas through execution and validation in support of the STP. To gain a list of savings opportunities to consider, we use three main sources. Previous savings opportunities identified through our merger work, but not already implemented. BCG ideas based off their experience, their benchmarking, and their discussions with our employees. Then lastly, ideas generated through facilitated ideation sessions with various levels of, of managers within different areas across Evergy. Ideas from these three sources ultimately vetted and approved are documented in a tracking system along with related milestones toward achieving the identified savings. John will speak a little more to this later. The execution phase has each milestone's progress tracked by the sponsor and the STO. So the STO is the program management office that we've set up to, to monitor our progress in the STP. This is where items that might fall behind planned are managed. The completion phase validates each milestones for an idea that has been completed and verifies the savings realized. And also make sure that these items are incorporated in future budgets. So far, we've identified about 230 of these savings ideas. Let's go into slide 12. I mentioned the STO and slide 12 shows the govern governance structure. The executive steering committee consists of all the officers of Evergy and is shown as in the upper left in the bright blue box. 
the executive core team uh, shown on the top right of the chart is led by Kevin Bryan, our COO, and includes eight other senior officers that represent all areas of the organization. I'm on this team and I represent all the support areas of Evergy, so including HR, supply chain, legal and compliance, finance, accounting, and other areas. The STO team is led by Brandy Wells. You see Brandy in the center of this slide uh, with more than a dozen non-officer leaders across the company uh, representing all of those areas. And that's shown in light blue across the bottom of this slide. Okay, on to slide 13. Uh, this will be my last slide before I turn things over to John Grace. This slide is reflective of both merger efficiencies and our additionally identified STP efficiencies. Our success to date uh, add to our confidence in our ability to continue this work and deliver the results outlined in the STP. We also know from our merger savings work, we won't achieve the desired savings in the exact way that we've planned under the exact timeframe that we've laid out. Some items will become larger opportunities, some smaller, while others might be realized sooner than planned, others later, and maybe even a few not realized at all, but with other ideas not known to us today to take their place. We do remain confident in delivering the overall results through the hard work of our Evergy team. This chart summarizes the fuel and purchase power savings as well as the non-fuel operating savings expected to be achieved through 2024 and they use 2019 actual results as our base period to measure from. The savings over the time, time horizon is what moves our cost structure to low second quartiles I discussed earlier. Nearly 150 million of fuel and purchase power savings and more than 200 million a year of non-fuel O&M savings annually by 2024. We have definitive savings plans for the vast majority of the opportunities through 2022 and a significant amount specifically identified for 2023 and beyond. John will discuss the components of these savings by functional area over the next several slides. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Um, please introduce yourself and take us through the next few slides and then I'll, I'll wrap things up before questions. All right, thank you, Greg. As Greg mentioned, I'm John Grace, Evergy's Director of Corporate Planning and Financial Performance. My current responsibilities include budgets, energy forecasting, and providing general financial support throughout the company. The next several slides will cover a few more specifics on how we plan to achieve the O&M and fuel and purchase power savings that are reflected here on slide 13. So moving to slide 14. The major areas of expected fuel and purchase power savings come from reducing the refueling outage durations at Wolf Creek and our coal plants through better planning guidelines and monitoring our outage metrics. And we are moving coal plant maintenance outages, outage frequency out to every three years to have them more available to the market. We are currently renegotiating coal and delivery contracts to take advantage of the geographic location of our coal facilities and our economies of scale. By deploying sensor technology on critical equipment and standardizing reliability-centered and predictive maintenance practices, we will improve generating unit reliability, which lowers costs for our customers. Improved flexible operation characteristics of units will result in improved load rangeability, improved cycling and startup times, and increased ramp rates. These improvements will help us more quickly adapt to the market and capture additional margin for our customers. Now shifting from fuel and purchase power reductions, we'll move to the highest value initiative in generation operations on slide 15. At Wolf Creek, we plan on accelerating the strategic reductions of positions into the STP time horizon and continue integrating Wolf Creek support functions such as HR, supply chain, and accounting within the Evergy fold. 
we have already taken the initial step to begin right-sizing our workforce at our non-nuclear power plants. Additional labor efficiencies will come from improving how we schedule work, eliminate redundant work, and equip our employees with the skill sets to be more effective, productive, and ready to take on different work as we continue to transition from fossil fuel generation to more renewables. Next, we plan to align our preventive maintenance strategy across our generation fleet to better align with industry guidelines and recommended practices. Condition-based monitoring of key equipment can allow for longer service life and often detect when replacement is needed before overtime is required to address the equipment failure. Outage optimization is centered around redefining employee roles and implementing and standardizing processes across our generation fleet in order to more effectively plan and schedule work. So moving to slide 16. So before I step through the major T&D cost reduction categories, let me note that there is about 12 million of reductions embedded in the first three categories related to normalizing our 2019 expenses for a large winter storm that impacted our Kansas City and surrounding communities. So our initiatives around vegetation management involve using data analytics to identify areas with the greatest opportunity for reliability improvements, eliminating low value added work and partnering with our contractors to streamline workflow processes. This creates a more strategic, focus approach to vegetation management rather than just a traditional cycle focused approach. Field force and contractor optimization are initiatives to standardize our T&D policies and procedures across all of our utilities. One example is implementing the practice to replace direct buried cable upon first failure rather than repairing and replacing cable after the second failure. T&D operations planning optimization includes items such as evaluating whether we can in-store streetlight maintenance more cost-effectively and with higher customer satisfaction. Now, we believe all these initiatives that we've been discussing have a high probability of success. However, in the case of evaluating whether to in-store streetlight maintenance, a pilot area would be implemented first to evaluate our performance before we would roll out to other areas. Okay, moving on to IT initiatives. The chartered efficiencies and commitments are comprised of the savings we committed to during the merger centered around system consolidation. This category also includes additional savings related to negotiating our various strategic enterprise agreements. And as it relates to our strategic enterprise agreements, we will continue to look for opportunities to extract, extract additional value from these arrangements as we evaluate suit, um, future software needs. We are continuing to rationalize the various security tools and software applications within the company to eliminate duplicative functionality and save on the associated maintenance and internal and external support cost. Our newer systems are being designed and implemented with significantly less customization, which requires fewer contractors and staff to maintain. And where it makes sense, we will be utilizing less expensive offshore support services. All right, slide 18 discusses our customer operations initiatives. And let me point out that we had a mistake on the presentation that was sent out last week. The last category that reads customer account management standardization on your screen mistakenly said cost allocation manual on the presentation that was sent out, just in case you're taking notes on that presentation. So I'll now begin the overview of customer operations. By implementing IVA technology, improving our IVR capabilities, and offering outage alerts for all of our customers, we can increase customer self-service, which will reduce calls into our contact centers, while at the same time increasing customer satisfaction. Expanding the utilization of AMI meters, we can reduce physical trips in the field and still have better visibility into the status of the grid. This also reduces the number of vehicles we need and will improve employee and customer safety. In addition to utilizing technology to make our contact centers more efficient, 
we will be relying on less contract labor and aligning the hours of our operations of our contact centers. And once our customer forward project is complete and all of our customer information is on a common platform, we will be able to take advantage of standardizing our billing services and credit management processes to further drive out cost. Okay, the last cost category is A&G on slide 19. And A&G includes functions such as accounting, finance, legal and compliance, HR, regulatory and supply chain. So we can't take credit for the single largest savings item on this list. Since we are measuring improvement in our cost structure from 2019, we remove non-recurring and one-time costs. These non-recurring costs included consulting fees, one-time lease expenses, and reducing the amount of our uncollectible expense to a more normal, normal level. These adjustments totaled about $15 million. Other savings within A&G are related to our ongoing efforts to have one Evergy process across all of our utilities and leaning out that Evergy process. Some of this is being enabled by more modern IT systems. Other areas of savings are through the rationalization of our demands for items such as consulting help and memberships. Much like this virtual meeting today, we will be relying on technology to reduce the amount of business travel going forward. You know, COVID has forced us to do things differently, and we will be looking to incorporate new opportunities and efficiencies into our ongoing operations and processes as we come out of our remote working conditions, hopefully sometime in 2021. Okay, moving to slide 21. Greg mentioned the tracking system where we are documenting and tracking the operational efficiency initiatives that have been identified. I'd like to step through an illustrative example. Although not shown on the slide, each initiative has a charter, which includes a general description, potential risks to the, to the success of the initiative, risk mitigation tactics, and if the initiative is dependent upon the success of other activities. The screenshot from the tracking system is difficult to read, but it lays out the roadmap for this particular initiative, chemical contract renegotiations. The face of the charter would state the goal of reducing spend by 1.3 million on chemicals while having no impact on safety or reliability. The roadmap includes the action plan with important steps to take, the timeline associated with those steps, and the anticipated savings. Each milestone with an anticipated due date or date of achieving cost reductions will be tracked. The actual date of a milestone occurring and the actual cost savings will be validated through a series of internal reviews and approvals. As mentioned earlier, we currently have about 230 unique initiatives that we are working through and starting to track progress on. So I'll now turn the presentation over back to Mr. Greenwood. Technology got the best of me. Sorry about that. Okay, just a brief recap to uh, wrap up here on the on the last slide. So our employees have built the muscle memory and adaptability skills through merger integration and merger related savings that we have overachieved on to date. The STP leverages this, and with the help of BCG, it has enabled us to create a robust process to become even leaner as an organization. The results of these efforts will allow us to maintain long-term system reliability and modernize the grid, all while being respectable of, of customer bill impacts. So we look forward to uh, your questions in the next uh, phase of our discussion today, and I'll turn it back over uh, to Brian. So. Sorry for the delay. I, um, t uh, same technology gremlins. Um, just um, before I turn it over to the chair, I just want to note what we did successfully at the last work study. So I think we will try to implement it again is 
due to the large number of interveners um, going to try to limit each intervener to 15 minutes of, of questioning. Um, like I said, that worked well last time and uh, hopefully it'll work well again. Um, with that, um, I think I will introduce the commissioners um, so they may start their questions. So Brian, let's start with, I believe Commissioner Keene is right, is up first. Yes. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Greg and John, thank you very much for that. Uh, really uh, most granular and particular overview. Uh, to me, kind of putting it in my own terminology here, I think what you've given us is a pretty sophisticated overview of the cost management aspect of your strategic planning. That's how I saw what you presented. Uh, if we could take a look at uh, page nine, <clears throat> and uh, you need not throw it on the screen. Uh, if we could collect, well, it might be beneficial actually to uh, the participants who don't have access to this page. I stand corrected. <clears throat> We're working on it. Okay. Here it comes. Thank you, Brandy. There it is. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, you've identified this, I think, uh, uh, Greg, as perhaps the most important page within the uh, slide presentation. <clears throat> uh, I think several of them are important, but I'd certainly say this is right up there for sure. And I think, uh, if I understand correctly, this really represents in one diagram here your effort at benchmarking, I think that's the way you referred to it, your cost structure. Um, and from what I understood here, if we, if we go to, from the 2019 actual out to the uh, 2024 anticipated, if I understood you correctly, I think you said that you're anticipating an annual cost improvement of about 300 million per year. Did I understand that correctly? That's correct. And if we look at some of the various functions, uh, that's, that's operational cost savings, I presume, is what that is. Can you, can you just give a little more definition to, 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 to what that consists of? You bet. I'm, I'm glad to. So of that uh, $300 million, and remember that that builds from 2019 through each year until we get to 24, so it doesn't happen all at once. Um, but that's made up of as much as around $150 million of savings from fuel and purchase power and around 200 million a year in 2024 for non-fuel related savings. So th those two components are the, the attributes that move us into the low second torquile uh, in the benchmarking. Okay, very good. And then as I understood it, Greg, again, <clears throat> the principal drivers for these, as I think from, from what I took it, were basically two major ones. One were one was the realization of economies of scale, and uh, not to say it isn't interrelated, but another major category were the uh, those derived from merger cost savings. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's the one thing that's a bit confusing, but also quite interesting. Uh, when we uh, at the time the merger was approved, we laid out a plan to achieve over six hundred million dollars of gross savings, and that was cumulative over the time frame. Uh, for the next five years. Two and a half of those five years are behind us. Some of those efficiencies are still ahead of us. And so some of the savings that are included in the STP, uh, a portion of those are also savings that we anticipated for years three through five uh, from merger savings. Okay, very good. Uh, perhaps a slightly unfair question. I don't intend it to be that way. It just may be that I'm not articulating the question in the best way I could. <laughs> but of these savings, what portions of these would you identify as directly traceable to the um, uh, implementation, I guess, of the SDP 
um, plan versus those that might have been realized uh, without the STP plan? Yeah, that that's a great um, question. It's hard to split the savings between merger related and STP related. Um, so the good news is, uh, regardless of what we label the savings, they all go to the benefit of customer bills at the end of the day. So that's the good news, but trying to to uh, split them. But many of the ideas that John spoke to are uh, items that uh, BCG helped us uh, uncover through the, the three different buckets that we talked about. Two of the three buckets of ideas generation came directly out of their help with us. The first bucket, as you might remember, were ideas that we didn't adopt into our merger savings um, leading up to uh, the merger approval, because at the time they didn't, they seemed like they had more risk than benefit, but as time moves on, um, it made sense to reevaluate some of those ideas. Okay. Um, if, if I could turn to something that may be a little beyond the scope, I don't think so really. This is, <laughs> your, your slide presentation is so holistic, it's probably unfair for me to say it that way, but um, if I could ask you a bit, something about generation, if we could turn to, to that topic just a bit. <clears throat> um, I guess the question generally would be, um, will the company realize any additional generating generation efficiencies through the STP process? Yeah, so as we laid out the STP, um, there, there are some generating savings. Some of those in the very latter years would relate to coal retirements and replaced by uh, renewables, likely solar. Um, you know, those are what's in the plan, but we have an integrated resource plan that's ongoing that I spoke to. Uh, we had meetings just late last week. That, that process will ultimately inform um, if we got it right in the STP as filed or whether that process indicates uh, that we need to make some adjustments to the timing and scope of, of that transition and, and that'll affect uh, the savings that are, are realized. And if, if memory serves, I believe the, the next step or, the, or one of the final steps, one of the final near-term steps uh, with respect to um, uh, the IRP is going to happen in advance of our fourth work study. Am I correct in the, in the time sequencing on that? Yeah, so we will our file. Fourth, our, our, our fourth one is May, pardon my interruption. Yeah, yeah so we'll, we'll file our integrated resource plan um, in Missouri uh, the end of March, first day of April. Um, our filing date for the IRP in Kansas is July 1st. Um, so while we may not have filed the final plan, um, it will be uh, largely put together given our other obligations. And so at our May meeting, we would anticipate to have uh, input from that IRP process reflected in any adjustments we would make to the STP. So I think mostly yes is the answer to your question. Uh, the May meeting will be informed by uh, a near, near final IRP process in Kansas. Okay, I might defer until that time some of the generation questions I would like to ask of the company, but if I could ask you ask a few of them right now because it, it, it all ties in to, to, it all ties in as I see it uh, each uh, each of the uh, uh, conceptually each of the uh, major components of your operations um, affect the others and so too I would guess would be the case with with generation. Um, I noticed you indicated during your presentation that I think it was at least a goal um, uh, that the company might be able by 2030, I think you said, to uh, have at least, I think you were saying maybe 80% of uh, your generation capacity from renewables. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. And again, that, that is highly dependent on stakeholder input to um, our integrated resource planning process that we, that we just discussed. Uh, but certainly that is an outcome with uh, stakeholder support and uh, coming to you know, a, a method in which we can manage the remaining investment in our fossil fleet would allow us to, to get to those levels of clean energy. Sure. Um,
is it a goal of the company to ultimately reach the point where there is 100% rely, rely, reliance upon renewables as your base load fuel sources? You know, we don't have that commissioner as a stated goal today, um, but largely because we need battery technology to uh, mature in both its capabilities and its and its costs, so that it's an economic and reliable resource for our customers. Um, so while we have no stated goal, uh, as technology continues to increase, uh, an ever cleaner uh, resource uh, mix. Uh, it is certainly the reality that we work toward. Well, I thank you for that. I think that's a great answer because um, it, it's sort of a, 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 excuse me, sort of a form to me of scenario planning with contingencies dependent in this instance upon the technological advancements that we, we, we find difficult to forecast at this point. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that's that's very fair, and and you know one of our follow up questions that we'll speak to a little bit later is um, what our uh, generation mix looks like from both a capacity standpoint and an energy standpoint. And we had a little discussion about uh, gas and and the changes to our our gas fleet over time. Um, and while we have twenty five or so percent of our capacity in in natural gas power plants. Any given year, we we use we we only meet customer demand or energy demand with about five or six percent natural gas, and it's a it's a small piece of our mix. It's cost effective, but it also is what enables us to build more and more renewable energy because it's the it's the fuel source that can follow those variable resources and and balance the the energy on the grid to meet customers' needs twenty four seven. Batteries at some point in the future can help meet that instead of gas, but at this point, it's a, it's a very important uh, fuel for our mix as we transition to more and more clean energy. Very good. Uh, I have several other questions that uh, pertain to generation issues. I think I'll defer them until we reach that point when you come back and discuss uh, some of the generation capacity and mix issues uh, later in the day. Uh, for this time, that uh, concludes my questions. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Keene. Um, I will now turn to Commissioner French for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Greenwood. Good morning. I have just uh, one comment and then a couple short questions. First, I, I think I just want to make the comment that um, I, I think your cost savings work has been an unquestioned success. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think there's obviously concern, you know, that maybe we're, we're just creating headroom and then we're replacing those savings with rate base. And, and you know, that's probably where we need more, more conversations. Um, but, but I don't want to get bogged down in, in negative, uh, the negative or those counter arguments. I mean, what I want to say is everything I have seen uh, over the last few years has shown me uh, that the cost savings work that I think you, Mr. Greenwood, uh, have, have led uh, has really been an unmitigated success. And so I want to I want to thank you for that hard work uh, because the money that you're saving is is saving customers money. And so I, at the outset, I want to get that out there that that I think Evergy has done a fantastic job of uh, looking at itself very candidly uh, and and seeing where you could trim trim the fat, so to speak. And, and I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll accept that on behalf of our 5,000 employees. So thank you. <laughs> uh, let's turn to uh, slide eight. And I, you can, uh, it might be helpful to put it up um, just to see what I'm, I'm talking about here. All right. We're uh, oh. perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, Commissioner Keene went to slide nine. I'm going to slide eight as my favorite slide. I I, yeah. I really like this slide um, because I I think it basically tells the whole story, <laughs> the whole story of sort of the merger and the and the ongoing STP effort. Now, granted, different different stakeholders are probably going to see a different narrative uh, in this slide, but I think it is a really illustrative slide um, that that just tells the whole story. Um, my question is this, uh, you have uh, this third bullet point on the left. Uh, 
Yeah, my, my thinking is this, you know, I, I think everybody knows, you know, customer bills have, have gone up quite a bit in the last uh, maybe 15 years. And I think your average customer would probably say, you know, my, my bill has increased quite a lot, and, but I'm really receiving the same service I received <laughs> 15 years ago. Um, and so I'm very intrigued by this last bullet point um, where it says customer bills will be shifted to reflect service enhancing infrastructure. Um, and I, I guess my question is, does that just mean more of your capital is gonna be allocated to uh, plant infrastructure and plant uh, instead of just O&M and fuel? Um, and there's sort of an assumption that infrastructure is more beneficial to customers than, than those items. Um, is it as simple as that or is there is there a deeper meaning in that bullet point? Yeah, I think, um, well, I appreciate you bringing this chart up because it does show all aspects of what goes into a customer bill. Um, there probably is more to it. I think there will be a, a, a focus on grid investment as we talked about on December 3rd versus um, um, you know, building generation or environmental controls, et cetera. So that's why this is on here. And what Mr. Aiken talked about um, in work study number one is that we always have more projects that we could uh, invest in on behalf of customers than we have capital available. And, and when I say capital available, I'm not talking about our ability to raise money in the capital markets. Um, our, our ability to raise money in the capital markets is not the limiter in, in why Mr. Aiken can't build that next project. Typically, it's customer bill impacts. Um, and I know people like to pick on utilities and pick on Evergy for uh, uh, cost increases, um, but, but they are, at some regard, a, a reality as much as we try to to, uh, to measure them. So we, we have investments that we feel like may, may uh, have positive benefits for customers that typically um, we can't get to them um, to try to manage overall costs to customer bills. The STP and the operational efficiencies that we just talked about are the things that allow us to move a little further down that list to modernize the grid, to, to arrest any degradation and system reliability that we know will happen at some point and, and, and even enhance that reliability. So I, I hope I answered your question, but I'm not 100% sure that I did, Commissioner. I, I think so, you got a lot in there. Um, I mean, I, I think it's an important question and it's, you know, it's important in anybody's evaluation of the STP, um, you know, to understand if we're spending more, what are we spending it on? Um, you know, and, and to the extent it does enhance customer service, that's, you know, that obviously goes in the, in the good column. So uh, that, that's a helpful comment. Let's move to that slide nine, the next slide. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know that this number is stated here, but, but you talked about it and, and Commissioner Keene talked about it, that, that we're seeing um, about a $300 million reduction uh, to, uh, to ex your expenses, um, you know, over this process from 2018 to 2024, and I, I guess this is this is the an overarching question to me, and, and it's going to sound a little antagonistic, and I promise I do not mean it that way. Um, it's a question that I think customers deserve to know the answer to, or to have an explanation of, and I, and I think it's a question. Um, that you need to have an opportunity to address with customers. And since we're streaming to the public, you know, I want to ask it, um, you know, can you explain to customers um, why Evergy pro projects uh, to keep rates at similar levels to even increasing uh, at the pace of inflation if the cost of serving customers is going to reduce by $300 million a year why aren't customers receiving a rate decrease, a big rate decrease, uh, as a result of, of the cost savings of $300 million per year? Yeah, so as, as it's, it's a good question. Um, so it's as part of um, meeting all of the customer needs, because we have a variety of stakeholders that all have different interests, as you've mined. We have some customers that want reliability is first and foremost. Uh, to them, we have others that want the, the very... Uh, you know, least expensive bill that, that can show up and they don't care how clean the energy mix is 
or or about uh, uh, other sorts of things. Um, so we, we have to balance all of those variant interests. And what we do know is that we need to invest more in our system. And the matter of, of, of it is, when do we do that? Um, and, and we were looking at um, areas to invest, you know, well before, uh, you know, uh, we had an activist investor involved or well before the STP was, was out, but we were focused on achieving all of our merger commitments. Um, you know, our, our thinking got accelerated by that. We probably wouldn't have gone to the extent to hire a consulting firm like BCG to help open our eyes to these efficiencies. But uh, these efficiencies allow us to manage customer bills and work our way down those list of items that can arrest what we know is, is system reliability degradation. We don't know if it's next year or 11 years down the road, but we know the age of the infrastructure and, and uh, Mr. Bryant and Mr. Aiken talked extensively about that. And so did Mr. Mulvaney. And so the, the result of modest increases in bill but not bill reductions is trying to balance all of those attributes. Appreciate the answer. I think that's all I have for now. I, I want to defer any any additional questions until after we sort of let the stakeholders go. But I appreciate your time, Mr. Greenwood, and I appreciate the responses. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Commissioner French. And um, if you could just keep your slides up there. But before, yeah. be before I jump into my questions, I'm glad you mentioned your activist investor. So, um, we have a merger and um, we're two and a half years, as you said, and you're tracking the proposed uh, merger savings. And we're not there yet. And today, Mr. Greenwood, you said some of them, we may exceed, some will meet, some may never materialize. So um, those are being tracked by you all and by our staff with your reporting in, so to speak. And in the old days, um, when I was in the budget division, I had SRS as a budget. It took up a whole wall, about six feet tall, to okay. track inputs, outputs, and outcomes. So on one level, I can just visualize, we're tracking the merger savings. Then the SDP ha happens. And I guess my concern is um, making sure that we're staying true to the original merger savings. And yes, we've introduced this new element called the STP. And on top of that, we have also the IRP. So we have three things going on simultaneously that intersect at certain points. But I do believe that it's important and that we stay true to the, um, the original commission's uh, merger um, and the agreement on, on the amount of savings to be materialized by the merger, again, outside of this STP. And why, why was the STP initiated, if you could respond, Mr. Greenwood? The, the STP was initiated uh, because um, at the, at the uh, I guess the uh, subtle nudge of an activist investor, they, uh, they challenged us to do better. And while we were exceeding all merger related savings and we continue to do that, um, we probably would not have uh, gone and hired Boston Consulting Group if, if not for that nudge. But all the components of the STP, IRP process, cost efficiencies, where to invest next, those were all things that we were already looking at trying to figure out, well, we know what we need to invest in the time the, the matter is when when is it time to do that and 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 try to improve our regional rate competitiveness we we couldn't we couldn't do that at the time make those investments because our cost structure didn't allow it to to maintain customer bills at a at a modest 
impact. Through our work with BCG, um, they opened our eyes to additional efficiencies that go well beyond any merger expectations for operational efficiencies and, and allowed us to, to make uh, additional capital investments on behalf of customers to, to modernize the grid and make it more reliable long term. Okay, so um, when, let's say the STP hadn't happened, and there was a freeze on the increases to customer bills for um, a period of five years. Mm -hmm. So when the five years was up, you anticipated a rate, a rate, uh, increase at that time is that correct that, that would that's that's correct and in fact it's it's almost ironic but if you look at what we call our base plan or the the plan that existed uh, prior to the STP and then compare the, the the revenues that retail customers pay between those two forecasts even with the increased capital investment but also with the operating savings net customer bills across both states I can't bifurcated between Kansas and Missouri was actually over $100 million lower with the STP and, and, and is lower than the STP. Okay. So, and um, playing into all this is the fact that there is virtually no load growth, no growth at all. I believe you said it was one half percent of 1%. Yes. Um, one half, one half of 1%. Yes. 1%. So that's virtually just static, is that correct? Well, again, our industry typically saw one and a half percent. And um, so any growth helps offset inflation and other cost increases without a customer's bill going off up. So while a half of 1% is modest, uh, we're not gonna diminish it because it, it's all part of that growth helps keep customer bills low. Okay, so if we could go back to page eight um, on bullet two, where we talk about the approximately 2% annualized. So that would be annualized over how many years again? Uh, five year, five year so period. At the end of five years, we're looking at a 10% growth. Uh, we're, we're looking at um, what we've so said. 10% increase rather. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be 10%. So what we've said in our STP, we're rounding numbers, but the the compound annual growth rate for that five-year period as stated in our STP report from August is 1.6%. Even uh, with all the savings that you've articulated um, still resulting in an increase for this, um, for, for customer bills. Yeah, about, about one and a half percent per year. And again, that's across all four of our utilities. Right. Okay. And while I think you all refer to it as a modest increase, um, living in the budget world for years, that 2% um, really, um, when they talk about a growth, you always refer to it as modest. But when you were asked to reduce your budgets by 2%, a lot of times agencies felt that was draconian. So it kind of depends on what side of the dime you're on. So um, yeah, and annualized, I think is the other concerning um, thing. And I've talked about this before. So while we were on this page, the other column, what does that specifically refer to? I think you talked about, there was a slight increase there. What is other? Boy, I'll... Uh look to uh, look to my team for help that may just be you know property tax surcharges and the like but um, look a, look for a, a lifeline from my team for okay people that are familiar with the graph. we'll allow you one lifeline here all right <laughs> uh oh I'm done I should have saved it <laughs> oh I'm not hearing anything we'll okay. we'll take we'll take right. that question back sure. it's it's I've always kind of looked at it as a kind of other and rounding but we'll uh, we'll see what we can find for that Okay, all right, very good. Um, yeah, I just, it seemed to be a fairly significant block, but it was just described as ever, other. So um, wasn't too sure what that was related to. Then on page nine, if we could. Um, uh, 
So um, you, you discussed about something getting larger, Mr. Greenwood, and I was trying to track where you were on these quartiles and not sure um, what it was in relationship to. Um, I might be able to help. Okay, if you would. Yeah, I think my, my reference to something getting larger is um, we, we assume that there would be some inflation, general inflation from 2019 to 2024 um, in, in these benchmarking bars. So as you see the orange bars that say median, yes. uh, we increase those from the middle column of 1047 in orange to 1128, just assuming that there would be some general inflation in the marketplace. Um, because we, we were trying to, when benchmarking is tricky business, uh, trying to do it years out, you've got to make sure that uh, you assume something about how the benchmarks will change, not just your own cost structure. So we were trying to keep it apples to apples was our, um, by, by putting that increase in there. Okay. Um, and, and I think I went out there and took a look at um, what inflation the next five years and actually it's, um, it, it continues to be um, low. And so um, you're not expecting anything beyond average or modest or, is that correct? As far as how the, the benchmarks might move in the future? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we've just as, assumed uh, normal inflation or Bostic Consulting Group uh, put this chart together. I just assumed uh, a, a normal inflation factor. So nothing, nothing uh, step change different from the general marketplace. Okay, all right, very good. Then um, your banners along the bottom, starting on page 14. So um, for example, it says, expected to contribute 145 million in run rate savings, run rate. Can, can you explain that banner? Yeah, what that, what that is meant to show commissioner or chair, chair is that the savings uh, ramp up over time. So uh, we're in, you know, we're getting ready to start 2021 and savings will say let's look at the bottom category is two to eight percent on this slide that in 2021 that savings might be eight hundred thousand and then in in 2022 it might reach 1.2 million and so these these are values that are put out here in these ranges are what we expected the annual savings to build to over that remaining four-year period okay so if i took everything in the right hand column and added it up over time, um, that, that's what the 145 million is, is the um, one, two, three, four items there total? Yeah, that would be the, and, and again, yeah, so that if you had the actual values, and these are just the largest components, there are probably some other smaller components that we didn't put on the slide. But yes, if you added up all of those in 2024, they would total the 145 million, correct? Okay, so that's cumulative over the four-year time period. Uh, that's an annual decrease in 2024. So cumulative, the first year it might be 40 million, the second 60. So it would be much larger number if you were doing it on a cumulative basis. But this is what the annual value builds to over that four-year period. Oh, it's the annual value. So that was my other question. Each of this, each of these represent an annual value. An annual so, value in the terminal year of the STP 2024. So this 145 a year that's in the banner across the bottom, mm -hmm. that would that would be the ultimate annual run rate. But the year before that, it might only be 105 million. And I'm just making numbers up. And the right. year before that, it might be 70. So okay. if you're if you're doing cumulative, it's much larger than 145. If you're wanting to know what's the the run rate and how our cost structure has ultimately changed by the work over that four year period, the annual savings is 145. Okay, the annual savings is 145. Related to fuel and purchase power, yes. Okay, 
All right, I'm making a note here because I wasn't sure what that. So then if I look on page 15, expected to contribute 30 to 40% um, of 2024 in FOM run rate. So it's the same thing as what we're looking at here. All of those where you have run rate in the banner at the bottom. Yeah, that's a, that's a good good question. So the previous slide was the fuel and purchase power component of the more, more than 300 million of annual savings. Right. Now, right. now the rest of these charts, starting with this first one, this is are the components of the 210 million okay. of annual savings. And so of that 210 million, 30 to 40 percent would come from the generation area. And then we go through the, the other uh, work streams of the company in the next few slides after this one. Okay, so let me flip over there and take a look. All right, so um, then as I look at your page 17, 8 to, 8 to 12, and page 18, 8 to 12%. Okay, all right. All right. All right. Um, so um, it was interesting, you shared with Commissioner King natural gas is 5 to 6% of your uh, fleet. Uh, portion is that correct currently right now yeah and we have a pie chart that we can uh that we'll show later that makes it a li little easier to wrap your head around this um, okay. and and what we're saying is um we have a certain amount of our all of our generating assets that is natural gas and that's 25 to 30 percent of our total assets on an annual basis when we go out to actually generate energy for customers in the most cost effective way, we only end up producing about five to 6% of that total energy from those gas assets. So it's a matter of installed capacity versus how you utilize it to most economically serve customers. Okay, all right. And Mr. Greenwood, as you're in charge of um, administrative things. So that would be staff overall, staff salaries and wages and and um, OOE, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, that, that's actually in our human human resource area, which is outside my purview, but. But, okay. Um, in terms of savings there related to staffing levels, um, are there proposed staffing levels savings beyond the merger totals? Uh, there are, uh, yes, there are. Does that result in reductions, for example, here in Topeka or where specifically, can you provide like where um, those would occur and what they are, whether it's field staff or um, office staff? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Our our field facing employees, those those uh, those levels don't change uh, as part of the STP or as part of our original merger plan. So, uh, field force folks are are the same. Um, so, support functions uh, are the areas that do get smaller over time, um, and um, uh, from. We will, when we do release staff, we'll reduce it generally balanced across Kansas and Missouri. Um, and we obviously have a specific commitment to Kansas to maintain certain numbers of employee staff. And we'll, we'll first and foremost, you know, the first uh, commitment we had when we put the STP together was to, to stand, stand by all of our merger commitments, which, which we will and we do. Okay, all right. And in terms of customer support, um, I know that with a more modern system that there's perhaps more responsibility on the customer, but uh, what about that area of customer um, support that when you dial a number, there's somebody there? Mm -hmm. So we, our customer support folks are, are centered in Raytown, Missouri and in Wichita, Kansas. And as we get on one customer platform, which will happen early next year, um, we'll have lots of leaning out of processes and, and uh, installation of technology. So we will evaluate over time as that technology gets in place and customer preferences. As much as you and I probably like to talk to someone on the phone, I know my, uh, my kids, the last thing they want to do is talk to a, 
a call rep, they want to do online chat or, uh, you know, do something on a, on an app on their phone or something. Um, so we'll, we'll evaluate customer needs to make sure we can meet their expectations for service levels. And, um, and, and we'll see what that, that leads, leads to from a, you know, technology standpoint. Okay. Thank you very much. And yes, I'll, um, we'll wait for the rest of the presentation for um, additional questions from commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Greenwood. Um, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Grace. We um, appreciate your presentations today. So at this time, I believe I'm turning it over to Brian. And um, Brian, do you want to, um, I know we're getting close to 1030, an hour and a half, but I would like to get, uh, or excuse me, 1130. Um, uh, couple um, of, of uh, the interveners um, completed before we take a quick five minute break. Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Duffy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we, we can begin hearing from the interveners now. And as a reminder, um, when you introduce your questioners, please identify them by name and title. Um, and likewise, if uh, whoever is responding uh, for Evergy could also identify themselves. Um, and if there are any questions that relate to confidential information, please reserve those uh, for a potential closed session at the end of the work study. Um, with that, we'll start with the interveners in alphabetical order. So, uh, Curb and Mr. Nickel. Brian? Thank you, Brian. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Nickel. Um, just real quickly, uh, I have to jump off here for another hearing. Here shortly. I did talk to my expert for NRDC, and, and we don't have any questions for this part of the presentation. But I just wanted to make you uh, aware that way, uh, if, you, if you call our name, that we don't have any questions at this time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Connor. Thank you, Mr. Fredoten. Uh, Dave Nickel on behalf of CURB. Uh, we will abide with the 15-minute uh, time limitation that you have with regard to questions. Our questions will be posed by Andrea Crane, who is president of Columbia Group and our uh, expert uh, consultant in this matter. Thank you. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great, great, much better this, this session than last session. <laughs> uh, um, my first question is, um, you mentioned that later on in the presentation, you will be providing some updates um, from the first workshop. Uh, you'll be providing some updates in response to some questions that, that arose there. Um, I just wanted to know if you sent out any written material relating to those updates prior to prior to today? No, we didn't send out any materials prior to, but these are all uh, requests that after the meeting, we'll send more formal written responses to what we cover verbally today. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, my first, and I, I only have a few questions. Um, question, slide nine, which, um, you said was important and you're getting a lot of questions on slide nine. So um, you spoke about the fact that the median was indexed, the benchmark was indexed to inflation um, from 2019 to 2024, that there was some assumption of, of inflation in that, <clears throat> in that median. I just wanted to confirm that the companies estimates of its own performance on that slide similarly include an estimate of inflationary costs over that period? Yes, they do. So the, the results on there for the company's performance, we expect that to be the, the nameplate value of our expenses on our financials in those years. Okay. And you um, mentioned earlier that it's very difficult to extract the merger related savings from the STP savings. But I guess my question is, um, how much of the merger related savings had not yet been achieved, um, let's say by 2019, or as you begin the STP or whatever frame of reference you want, you, you, you'd care to provide? Yeah, and I'm trying to think of what's in the in the public realm here, um, but we're running well ahead of plan in our merger savings achievement. How much of that is because savings were being achieved earlier versus uh, 
inc incremental savings, um, I'm unsure, but we were were performing ex exceptionally well versus the the merger savings and well ahead of plan. I'm I'm not sure that I'm answering your question though. Okay, and. I, I, maybe I should know this, but I don't off the top of my head. Is there some document or some place where you're providing on an annual basis um, reporting the total merger savings by, you know, by year? Yeah, help. I'm trying to think of what the parties get confidential. I'm looking around the room here, Andrea. Give me just a second. And I'm not necessarily asking for numbers now, just is there a document out there that you file regularly? Because I mean, that maybe there is and I just don't get it. Yeah, Andrea, this is, uh, this is Darren Ives. I mean, we, we have been providing uh, uh, updates to, to, to Curb and staff and the commission in the, uh, in the merger docket that have uh, talked about the, the success on the, the merger efficiencies and where Mr. Greenwood, I think, is struggling is there's there's usually two versions of that. There's a there's a high level that shows kind of the level we're exceeding the plan, but then there's a confidential version that uh, has a little bit more detail in the specific areas where where that occurs. But I think we're now at least have been on a six month cycle here lately. Okay, thanks, Darren. Um, there's been a lot of discussion too about this. Um, $300 million reduction and why isn't there a, a why can't um, rate payers expect to see a rate reduction um, given the fact that there will be this $300 million reduction that we talked about on, on slide nine. And I guess I, I just kind of wanted to, to point out and confirm that slide nine is just non-fuel O&M. So while that is being reduced by 300 to 350 million dollars. Actually, if you flip back to slide eight, that's really more the total revenue requirement, and that actually is, even as shown on this schedule, does increase from 2018 to 2024. So, um, on the on a total revenue requirement basis, you are not you are not projecting a reduction in that in that revenue requirement. Is that correct? That, that's correct, and that's why Commissioner French pointed out that he liked slide eight over slide nine because it was the whole picture, um, and I think Commissioner Duffy made the other comment. The reason to go from eight to nine for purposes of today was to, to narrow in on the, the topic of today, which was uh, operational savings, but okay. you're, you're and, absolutely correct. And, and in slide eight, is there, um, is there like a scale, like a vertical scale. I mean, do we, you know, do, what what are what are these totals in terms of dollars that are shown here on a revenue requirement basis? Yes, there there are dollars that back this up for purposes of staying in the public realm. We we've displayed it this way so we can have a discussion around it. But yeah, there there are uh, financial models that have the the component pieces to that. Sure. Okay, so that was a confidentiality concern then. Correct. The, okay. Um, let's see. I had a question about 14, but I think the uh, the chair actually, Chair Duffy actually uh, asked that. So I guess 19 is my next one. And on 19, there's um, a reference there under the one-time cost um, of, of a change or reduction. Um, to short-term incentives, um, can you can you provide any more explanation about that impact on short-term incentives and whether that was a, a prospective change to incentive programs or was that a, a non-recurring type of type of charge? Yeah, that, that was much like we do when we have rate cases, Andrea. As you might remember, we usually smooth that with a three-year, five-year average, et cetera. The actual payout in 2019 was above the, the target. And so we just reduced that to the target level for purposes of uh, normalizing uh, cost structure. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, finally, um, the, when, I, when I try to compare 
some of the information in your presentation to um, some of the underlying numbers, and I won't get into any numbers um, this morning or the, it's, it's actually afternoon where I am. Um, <laughs> but when I tried to compare some of the numbers um, from, from the Boston Consulting Group material, you know, th th they didn't always match. And um, I think one of the ans one, one of the things I was going to ask, ask you about, but you, you've already indicated, is that on some of these slides where you have the percentage of 2024 NFOM, um, you haven't listed all of the categories. You've only listed the, what, what you call here the highest value function areas. But I guess my question is, does the, um, the material provided in the Boston Consulting Group documents remain sort of the um, the standard that you are using now to um, to plan the STP and presumably to um, chart your progress in the future, or have you taken those numbers and made further revisions to those? And is there some other document now that is um, that has sort of almost replaced the Bot the Boston Consulting Group? documentation and that you're working from? Because I know, I think you mentioned in the last workshop that there have been some changes and maybe some dollars flipped among categories and that sort of thing. So, so what is the current planning document that the company is using? Uh, the, the current planning document is uh, uh, a, a financial forecast that is, that is confidential um, and it ties in large part to the report that we filed in August. You remember the BCG materials uh, were finalized in the month of May, and they are strongly indicative of what makes up the STP. But even as you look through there, you, you will see certain pages that talk about management's view, BCG's view. And so there are places where uh, we didn't have perfect alignment with what uh, me and my colleagues thought were possible and what BCG thought. And so ultimately we had to coalesce those into the actual STP. So I would say the STP documents are very detailed, very information rich and largely consistent with the current status of the plan, but they are not precisely uh, the plan. So if you, know, you can't tie numbers exactly, that, that would not um, shock me because the plan has evolved as we've got into more granular plans on uh, you know, how to invest and how to put these detailed milestone 230 ideas or savings charters in place. Okay. And, and is there, and has that, has, has a further document been provided that ties into the August plan? Yeah, I would say we don't have anything as uh, uh, pretty and rich and so on as BCG had put together. Um, but, but we do have, you know, documents that help um, uh, further describe the plan, and, and some of those have been, I think, filed in this docket. Um, some may or may not have at this stage. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. M Mr. Laughlin, uh, on behalf of Climate and Energy Project. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, at this time, CEP doesn't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Grain Belt Express, Mr. Schulte. Thank you, Mr. Fidoten. Um, Nicole Lucky, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Invenergy uh, is on the line and has some questions, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And thank you to the commission and to Evergy for the opportunity to talk through the STP presentation today. Um, so it looks like you have a lot of operational savings attributed to running the coal plants more efficiently and, and more often and accounting on additional sales there. Is, is Evergy assuming potential exposure to a carbon price and assessing how that price might eat into assumed savings? Yes, we are. So part of our integrated resource planning, one of the, the key uncertain uh, uh, estimates that we need to come up with is, you know, what possible carbon pricing is out there. And so we look at various scenarios that look at the cost of carbon in, in those resource plants. And, and what sources are, is Evergy looking at to determine um, what the appropriate price is? I would look to, I don't know. Um, 
I, I don't know what those sources are. I'm looking around the room. I don't see that. Are, are you guys involved in that docket? We are. Okay. So that, that should be available to you um, in that docket. I, I know those those assumptions are, are highly confidential, but if you're a part of the docket, you should be able to get access to those. Great. Thank you. Um, so, and this may also range into the confidential information territory. So just tell me if it does. Um, which coal plant specifically is Everdee planning to run more often? Um, are there one or two more efficient plants that you're planning to focus on versus all the plants? Is that location-based, age-based? Well, I'll just speak generally. I mean, we, we dispatch our plants through the Southwest Power Pool in the most economic way to, to serve our customers. So that would depend on market conditions at the time, the level of uh, uh, no cost production facilities like uh, all of our, our wind farms. Um, so we, we don't have a, a specific plan out under the numerous IRP scenarios. Those plans will be run in different fashions depending on fuel price assumptions, carbon tax assumptions, and, and you have access to the results of all of those through that resource planning docket. Okay, so I assume the optimization depends on whether SVP is selecting your coal plant as, as economic um, or not, right? That those savings? Yeah, that, that's one, one aspect that determines that, sure. Okay. okay, I only have one other question. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion in various stakeholder processes across various markets about using surplus interconnection service. Uh, I noticed you said that your gas plants are only running a small portion of the time. It looks like you're not running your coal plants 100% of the time. Has Evergy looked at interconnecting new generation resources at existing plants utilizing surplus interconnection to decrease the cost of uh, interconnection upgrades at those plants? No, we have not. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. IBEW uh, number 304, uh, Mr. Wood. Um, yes, thank you. I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, Midwest Energy, uh, Ms. Kallenbach. Midwest Energy, Ms. Kallenbach. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm trying to see if Tom Mice is still on the phone. Tom, are you still are you still engaged in? Yes, I'm right here. Um, no questions from me. Great, thank you. So, so does that mean uh, no questions from Midwest Energy then? Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Kepco, Miss Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Fidoten. Um, we do have a few questions and um, uh, Ms. Kimberly Frank will start off for us. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Frank, I think you may be double muted. Well, she had trouble with the mute process earlier, so we'll we'll see if we can get it figured out. Kimberly still can't hear anything. Kimberly? Can you all mm -hmm. hear me now? Yep, there we go. Thank, thank you all for your patience. I, I think I was triple muted. The, the, uh, the question that I would like to ask is to focus on some of the PowerPoint presentation pages, starting with page 16, and then also the spreadsheet that, that Evergy provided in response to KEPCO request 1-3. Now, that spreadsheet is not designated confidential, and the numbers that I'm looking at here are large numbers, so they're, they're aggregated. And I was wanting to confirm that it was okay to just name those, list those numbers out in the, in the spreadsheet. Is that all right? Give me the data request number again, please. 1-3, 1-3. 
it's it's a summary of the values um, that are found in some of the tables and pie charts in the in the STP. Yeah, I, I would. That's it sounds confidential, but if we could be careful, we can maybe proceed down that road a little bit. Darren's giving me the okay, so. Sure. Since, well, why don't we just. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Why don't, if we could turn to page 16 of the PowerPoint, please. Now, I understand from KEPCO 1-3 that on a company-wide basis, Evergy's estimating about, it looks to me, about $40 million in O&M savings in T&D. And I was hoping that you can help us understand what share of that estimated $40 million is uh, jurisdictional to the Kansas Commission, the Missouri Commission, and the FERC. Do you have those numbers or would you be able to provide them? Yeah. I don't have those at the T&D level. I know generally across all the operating cost structure as we've modeled them, the savings kind of fall out consistent with our customer base, which is kind of 60%-ish Kansas, 40% Missouri uh, on an overall cost structure basis. But for transmission only, I don't have that available to me. Um, if we did, I would probably need to talk to that in confidential sessions. So maybe we can, uh, we can table that one and maybe at the lunch break before confidential session, maybe we can figure out what we what we do have. Sure, thank you. And do I understand correctly that uh, page 16, the, um, the numbers, the values here, the 2024 run rate savings, that's for Evergy company wide, right? It is, yes. Yeah, all of these are. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Now, um, if you flip back two pages, to page 14 of the PowerPoint. And this goes back to, we're looking here at generation and fuel and purchase power. Um, and again, going back into KEPCO 1-3, I think we've got an estimate of about $144 million company-wide in fuel and purchase power for Evergy. Um, but I'm looking here, and it, it appears to me that uh, a large portion of that savings is coming from Evergy Metro. Uh, and actually, the savings, it looks like, for Evergy Kansas Central are negative. And I was wondering if you could help us to understand why the majority of fuel and purchase power savings seem to be accruing to Evergy Metro and uh, uh, as compared with the other Kansas utilities or one Kansas utility. Yeah, so so we, we are wandering into confidential information here a little bit. So we can we can speak to that a little little bit more, but probably should do it in confidential session. And I, I would just say, you know, measuring from 2019 actuals, the volume of energy that we produce in that year versus a normal year, those can cause some funky numbers to show up like you're speaking to. But if you, the, the better comparison probably for looking at fuel and purchase power is to compare that old base plan that I referenced uh, earlier in our discussions to the STP, then the volumes are about the same, and then you can see more of the real impacts. Is that fair, John? Yep, that's fair, Greg. Okay. So we can give you a little more granular, but John, I think that's probably better in the confidential session. Yes, it is. And we okay. can get into specifics there. Okay. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. I only have, I think one more question. I think it's, well, confirming that actually all of the, the instant numbers, the values on, on uh, 14 through 19 are Evergy wide. Um, 
My, my last question is, um, I understand that in the Missouri docket, the Missouri staff requested an extension of the due date of their report to late January 2021. And the reason for that was because they anticipated that more detailed and highly relevant information would become available between mid-November and December 2020 from Evergy regarding those plans um, for additional capital spending and operation and maintenance expense reductions. So it sounds to me from staff's motion, and for sure you can't speak to staff's motion, but has Evergy changed its plans? Do you have new additional information that alters perhaps the STP that you filed with the commission earlier this summer? Well, at, at risk of speaking for the Missouri Commission, which I hate to do, but I think generally the way I've interpreted that is that uh, M Missouri is is maybe you know less concerned with the STP. They are in favor of of aspects that make up the STP. Uh, there is uh, legislation in Missouri to encourage infrastructure investment consistent with grid modernization, con consistent with renewable plants. Uh, they're supportive of sharpening the cost structure of the utilities. And so I think that's part of what has caused them to take some time. And then as we've talked about on this call, um, while the BCG slides from May are, are strongly indicative of the STP, we've continued to, to work on uh, more granular aspects uh, of the plan as we move forward. And I think they just chose to wait for more information. Okay, and, and as Ms. Crane indicated or, or asked earlier, she asked whether there had been sort of some new information that was avail made available by Evergy, but perhaps maybe we can discuss a little bit more of that on during the confidential session. Uh, yes, or we'll, we'll do some checking into to those. I, I don't know if we're going to have all the answers by then, but, but certainly. Darren, Thank anything to add much. on Missouri? No, I, I, I think you've got it right, Greg. Um, you know, we've talked about and we talked about in, in workshop session one, I mean, we continue to do detailed planning and, and you know, or, or finalizing our budget for 2021, which certainly has uh, specific savings. We talked about the, the 230 initiatives in, in this session that are that are ongoing that continue to inform our, our direction forward. So, you know, strongly indicative is the right word for the BCG materials, but but we continue to plan and, and we're also working on our updated five-year plan that we'll, we'll take to our board in February. And that, that all continues to, to move our planning forward. Yeah, and we have capital plan filings in Kansas that are due in the first quarter of, of next year, consistent with that work that we continue to do today. Thank you. I, I have no further questions. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Before we, this is Susan Cunningham again. I'm sorry. Before we um, move to the next party, I just want to um, touch base with Mark Doljak um, and Rebecca Fowler to see if that addresses all of our questions for the public session. Uh, yes, Susan, no questions for me. No questions for me. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we've been going for uh, almost two full hours now. Um, so it might be an appropriate time to take a lunch break and then resume with uh, Mr. Vincent and KIC after the lunch break. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to the chair uh, to determine how long a, a break um, the commission plans to take. Thank you. I appreciate that, Brian. Um, it's 11.55. <clears throat> Why don't we uh, just plan to reconvene here at um, 12.30, everyone. Uh, remember to mute your, um, your mics, please, and uh, we will see you at 12.30. And we will begin with Robert Vincent. Thank you.
Well, they're, they're on their third string, third string, uh, right tackle, hurt left tackle, guy they just picked up off of waivers playing guard, backup center. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Hey, j just an FYI, there's somebody that's not muted.
Good afternoon, everyone. It is 1230. We will resume, resume our discussion. And I believe Mr. Fidoten, there you are. Yes. You're there. Okay. If you'll proceed. Thank you. Sure. Um, it looks like we're recording and I believe we were ready for KIC and Mr. Vincent. Uh, so Mr. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Fedoten. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Mr. Greenwood. Good afternoon. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, just a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, leading off with some of the discussion KEPCO was having, KIC does believe it's important to understand the jurisdictional and service territory breakdown of where NFOM and fuel purchase power costs, no savings will flow. Uh, we do have access to one of the company's confidential financial models. So I'll withhold on any questions on that right now, but just wanted to let you know, we'll probably have a couple of questions on that uh, when we get to the confidential portion of today's discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, we... Do you have your presentation? In, do you have your presentation in front of you? I do. And would you mind turning to slide eight, please? and let me know when you're there. That's more popular than nine. I'm a little disappointed. But. <laughs> I, I, hopefully I can have a question on nine too. For you. Okay. Um, during your introductory remarks on this slide, you were mentioning load growth and I think the good old days of about 2%. And then you indicated that it might only be about half a percent uh, going forward or that's what you're projections seem to indicate. My question for you is, and it's kind of a three-part question related to electric vehicles. Um, does the load growth projection percentage that you referenced earlier include an assumption of any particular EV adoption? Yeah, not materially through 2024. Um, that's certainly an aspect of the resource planning, which is more of a 15 to 20 year look, it would it would look at that, but not between now and 2024, it would, it's not expected to be material. Okay, so, so just to run down that line a little bit further, in the IRP presentations, there have been discussions on uh, beneficial electrification, and there are some projections on that kind of a low, mid, high, and then a, a best case electrification um, uh, projection. Just kind of curious if if uh, your your half a percent figure ties into any one of those four, mine was a general comment about uh, you know what we experienced the last five years or so, and and what we expect to the next few years. But again, it wasn't out fifteen or twenty years like the resource plan discussions are. Okay, uh, turning to slide nine with you, if that's okay. Sure. So my question is actually on some of the uh, text at the bottom of the screen. And it's really just kind of a confirmatory question. On the third line in the gray text, starting about midway through it, it says O&M costs listed includes total transmission expense uh, with, with some exclusions. Um, and I'm not an accountant or financial analyst, but when I see total, that to me, that seems like it's everything. So I just wanted to make sure, do the NFOM levels uh, that are presented on the screen include any of the dollars that would typically be recovered through the commission's transmission delivery charge? Yes, it's the full cost structure of the company. So it would include all costs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think my next question is gonna be on slide or sticking kind of with this um, general area. Earlier you had some discussion with the chair on a compounded annual growth rate and what the total rate impact for customers is going to be. And I think you mentioned something around the, the area of 1.6% CAGR. Does that, do you remember that discussion? Yeah. Uh across all of our utilities so total leverage if you will that's great i mean that you're i think you're you know exactly where i'm headed do you know um what the individual kansas 
jurisdictions of Evergy what their projected rate impact would be? I do know, and that's um, actually one of the confidential questions from the first session that uh, we'll cover in the supplemental materials in our last 30 minutes or so, or we can cover it in the confidential session of this session and we can speak to it uh, then, but uh, the jurisdictional split is confidential. Okay, no, you answered my next question. I was just making sure that was all teed up for a discussion today. Um, would you mind turning to slide 14 for me, please? You bet. And would you let me know when you're there? I'm there, thank you. Okay. Thank you. The second area of focus is um, coal contract renegotiations. Do you see that? I do. Generally speaking, it's my understanding there is you know, quite a bit of renewable resources in SPP that's only projected to continue to grow. Um, utilities are using more natural gas in their fleets, so coal prices in general, it's my understanding, are, on, are under fairly significant pressure. Um, has the company modeled how much the uh, coal contracts would reduce just because of the current state of affairs and not anything directly attributable to the company? And is it because they're under so much pressure? Is that is it fair to try and say that that, uh, that this that those lower prices are going to result from the STP? So you're saying bec you want to know why customer bills go down because of lower fuel costs? You're, you're not. No, so, and apologies if. if uh, well, go ahead. Uh, so so I, we'll give you credit for it if you want, but but those costs lower customer bills when we go in to negotiate a contract and try to figure out how much is our own doing or would have fallen in our lap if we hadn't done anything, that's pretty hard to separate those things out. Um, but one of our strategies is, is to hedge our fuel. And one of the ways that we do that is we have some contracts that are very short duration. We have some contracts that are medium term and some that are long term. Because our goal is never to be, uh, you know, to hit a five run homer for customers on fuel, right? Our goal is to, provide low, stable, predictable prices for customers. And so if we happen to have a, a, a contract across those short-term, medium-term, long-term uh, contracts that happens to expire at the wrong time, um, you know, we don't have to take credit for it, but it, it still results in lower customer bills. Okay. I, yeah, I, think, I, think, that, uh, I think that answers my question. I, I appreciate you there. Uh, on, uh, on slide 15, kind of continuing our discussion on um, cost reductions, you, you referenced, I think it's outage optimization. I think that is the, the fourth bullet point here. And this is more, made, this is an operational question I'm just kind of curious about and looking to get a little bit more insight on is how will the company be able to predict what's the right time to take an outage? I know that it seems like a, uh, a question that could be analyzed with you know, some data analytics, but that's always gonna be backward looking, or at least that's my assumption. You're, you're never gonna be able to guarantee what some LMP is in the future. You'll only know if you hit your target after the fact. So, uh, so can you explain a little bit more on, on the steps the company's taking to, to uh, I guess, predict what times or what's the right time to take a plan offline? Yeah, so we can we can look at and and I might ask John Brits and our VP of Generation to uh, chime in after I'm I'm done or if you have follow up uh, questions to my response. But as far as timing of when we start an outage versus not, is that your primary question? Yeah, that, yeah, that's that, yeah, that that's yeah. a fair way to summarize. Yeah, so that primarily the timing of that primarily relates to changes at our nuclear plant as, as we've gone back and looked at hourly prices across spring and fall months, we found that, that if we, uh, on average, if we started our average a few week outages at Wolf Creek to refuel a few weeks sooner or later, we could get into those sort of shoulder months more, more uh, you know, dead center and have uh, the most power available in the market to replace the power of Wolf Creek uh, at a lower cost than the, the windows that we had been hitting typically. So it's really 
optimizing, you know, the, the law of averages of what market demand on an hourly basis is in the spring and the, and the fall months uh, versus the, the timing that we've historically taken outages. So it's a tweak, but when you're tweaking a nuclear plant, uh, it can be millions of dollars for customers. All right. That, so that's, that's a, fair, a fair point. Just to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, when we talk about outage optimization, the, comp- the majority of the company's savings are attributed to Wolf Creek's outage, optimizing when Wolf Creek goes on outage versus any one particular coal unit. Is that a, kind of a fair summary? No, and again, I'll, I'll look to John if uh, with needy. But your your question was specifically related, as I understood it, to starting of timing of outages and when they start. So that's related to to Wolf Creek, uh, at least uh, for the, any great extent. But outage optimization more broadly also relates to um, you know how frequently do you take a coal or gas unit offline uh, to do periodic maintenance. Um, you know, the best practice when I started in this industry was every 12 months, uh, and then it became every 18 months. Now, as the duty cycle of those coal plants have changed, and we have more sensors and intelligence on those units, uh, best in class is more like every three years. And so that's what we're looking at for our, for our coal, coal fleet. And if, if we only have a maintenance outage every three years, there's more days during that three-year period that that unit's available to the market. Uh, and if it's called upon because it's, it's a lower cost resource to meet uh, regional demand, customers save money. Okay. Well, uh, I might have a, a couple more questions on that if, if time permits, but uh, I'll keep moving on. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind turning with me to slide 16, please. And the top bullet point on this slide, it speaks to veg- vegetation management optimization. Do you see that bullet point? I do. And I believe during the company's introductory remarks, um, we spoke to how we can use some maybe digital platforms to help pinpoint which areas should uh, be prioritized for uh, maybe tree trimming operations. Do you recall that kind of opening? I do generally recall that, yes. Sure, and this question may not be uh, specific to you, so feel free to, to throw it to anybody uh, that you'd like. When I think, when I think of vegetation management, I, 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 my question is, of the two Kansas service territories, um, is, it, is it more focused heavily on one or the other? Is it more focused on Metro than Central? And if it is focused on Metro, Shouldn't we have enough outage data already, given some of the, uh, the old growth uh, trees that are that are in these dense neighborhoods? Uh, we should. I, I think if there was any uh, vegetation issue to to identify, we we kind of know about it already, and you wouldn't need new tools to go find find it. So, uh, would you mind speaking to again which service territories that's focused on, and and whether it's really needed to expand a vegetation management program? Yeah, I'll answer that at a high level, and then I'll see if Bruce Aiken or Andy have have something they want to add. They're that they're the experts. But you know, we spend about sixty million dollars a year trimming trees across Evergy, so sixty million dollars. Um, you know, and you know, you can you can know that you've trimmed trees, whether it's urban or rural. And, and our our main guiding principle is that we're going to stay on a cycle four years in the urban areas, six year cycle where it's more rural. And then we're gonna most cost efficiently, efficiently as possible stay on that cycle so we don't get behind. Uh, these tools allow us to do that more, more efficiently in these practices. Um, some, some practices are different between our u- utilities and so some benefit more from others from certain aspects of those savings. Uh, but trees grow every day. So just because it's an urban area and we know these old growth trees um, they're going to come back to visit our lines, and that's why we stay on those cycles. Um, it's, as far as any specifics for, uh, you know, areas of savings, I'd look to, to maybe Bruce or Andy to see if they want to add anything to my high-level response. And correct me if I was wrong, Bruce. No, you're correct. Greg, this is uh, Bruce Aiken. So there's multiple uh, components to the vegetation. One is kind of getting on a normalized basis. So we had a, a significant increase in, in the storm in the Kansas City metro area a year ago that we it comes off the top. Um, there is a significant savings on Kansas Central from going to target pricing strategy. 
uh, that was in place on the on the legacy uh, case PL uh, side. But then there's digital workflow uh, savings. There's uh, herbicide treatments and stricter controls on unplanned work that kind of span across across all of the territories. Okay, no, I I appreciate that. I was just thinking if um, if you're going to be on kind of a I'm not an arborist, uh, so a condensed tree trimming cycle uh, every four years you're kind of back in the same area. Generally, then uh, I wasn't quite sure why, how pinpointing fits into it because because you're going to be back there fairly frequently. So I pre I appreciate that answer. Yeah, um, the ability of technology and more data around that, which which we have now, uh, helps us better plan that work, which helps us get better pricing. Uh, is is okay. part of the part of that solution. Yeah. Thanks, Great. Bruce. Well, I, I appreciate the the dialogue with the company this this afternoon. Uh, I'm at I'm at 16 minutes now, so I'll I'll hold off on any other questions so other folks can uh, can do it. But thank you again to the company and to the commission for yeah. today's workshop. And I'll take the blame for my answers being too long, so not your fault. Thank you both, um, uh, Ms. Klein, on behalf of KPP. We don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, McPherson. We don't have any questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I know Mr. Connors had, had mentioned that uh, he had another hearing but didn't anticipate any questions. So I'll skip over him. Um, but uh, so that takes us to the Sierra Club. Uh, Ms. Woody. Hi, just a, just a couple of questions. First of all, I think you mentioned that you uh, anticipated perhaps moving some functions offshore. And I wondered if you could tell us what functions um, you anticipate moving offshore. I do remember mentioning that. I know some of our IT support, we, we use uh, uh, resources offshore to, to keep, you know, projects, et cetera, going 24 seven. I'm looking around the room to see if there are any other, other areas, just a common business practice these days to, to utilize them. I think that's that's the primary source as I look around the room. And do you anticipate that that is going to be a significant part of um, of savings by 2024? No. No increase in that significantly. It's not a significant portion of the overall savings. Okay. Um, let me let me if I understood you correctly. What percentage of renewables are you at now? We generate enough. Uh, renewable energy to serve about, I don't know, 35% of our retail load, uh, enough carbon free energy to meet about 50% of our, our retail load. Um, and year to date this year, it's a little over 55%. And when you say that in 2030, you're anticipating 80%, um, can you describe uh, how that if, how that falls? <laughs> Uh, we didn't say we anticipated. We said it's possible, depending on the outcome of the stakeholder process and the target, resource, right? re resource planning efforts. So uh, it's it's a possibility, depending on the stakeholders' uh, uh, will. And um, you know, we've got, we've got to pick as a group what is the right speed and path of transition to balance keeping customer rates low and further greening our. Uh, generation. We, we know that, that we will be cleaner and cleaner. It's a matter of pace. And in fact, we've, we've placed into service three wind farms, 600 megawatts of, of new wind uh, just in November and any day, um, you know, between now and the end of the year. And we've got uh, 400 megawatts more in 2021 that are currently under construction. And what percentage do you anticipate as of 2024? Um, that'll be something that we cover in the in the supplemental materials, but it'll be about uh, on a uh, energy basis. It'll be about uh, almost sixty percent uh, carbon free. So about a five percent increase then from where you are today. Uh, we're again assuming normal weather. We're about fifty percent. So year to date this year, we're about fifty five. Um, so five to 10% yeah. then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you anticipate subject to the stakeholder input in the IRP process, but that's, that's what's in the STP through 24. 
And are any of the savings that you're talking about related to this five to 10% increase in uh, renewables? Uh, savings and costs. So the costs of, of new solar facilities as modeled, about 900 megawatts in, through 2024. And then also uh, removing from service um, and recovering the cost of, of uh, 500 megawatts of coal generation. Okay. Thank you. Those are the questions I have. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian, before you move on, could I ask one follow-up to uh, Ms. Woody's questions? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, just, we were talking about percentages and I, I'm just curious, uh, you gave percentage, 35% uh, of retail load uh, with renewables and 50% of retail load with carbon free. I, I assume those, those would sound like we're energy numbers. What, what is the capacity percent for renewables right now and uh, capacity percent for carbon free, if, if you know those off the top of your head. Yeah, I do. And, and we'll cover this again with a picture um, in the, the later sessions, but I can, I can speak to these in public, public session. So just so we understand, I, you know, if you think about capacity um, of our units, that's if every piece of generation we had, if it was running at 100%, okay, that's what capacity is, if they're all running at 100%. Then as we, as we bid our units into the market and the SPP dispatches the production, zero cost production resources like wind and solar first, and then the lowest cost resources, that's how we get from capacity to energy mix so that we can serve customers at the lowest possible cost for not only our own generation, but the whole region. So just as a foundation of capacity versus energy. Um, from a capacity standpoint, um, we're about 28% uh, renewables today, and we'll be about 35% by 2024 as the STP is laid out. And again, that's subject to, to uh, faster or slower transition of the generation fleet, depending on the IRP process and the stakeholder input. And I assume that that contemplates nameplate capacity for for things like wind, it's not some sort of accredited amount. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to make that clear at the start. So when we're talking yeah. capacity, it's just assume every every unit's running at 100 percent at the time. <laughs> yeah. So so yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had, Brian. You can move on. Okay. Thank you, um, Miss Klein. <clears throat> any questions or comments on behalf of USD 259? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I think we're ready for commission staff, uh, Ms. Pemberton. Good afternoon, thanks, Brian. Um, I'm just gonna turn this over actually to Mr. McClanahan. So Mr. Greenwood, you're off the hook from my perspective for the moment. So I'll give it to Jeff and let right. him introduce his staff. Fantastic. Yeah, good afternoon, Greg. Hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, so with me today is uh, Justin Grady, our Chief of Accounting, uh, Cost of Service um, and Financial Analysis, as well as Adam Gatewood, our, our Senior Managing um, Financial Analyst, and Leo Hanos, our Chief Engineer. Um, Greg, I, uh, I only have one uh, point, and um, it's really for the public, I think. So it's uh, I think I know the answers to this, but I'll, I'll kind of set it up and with a preface that the savings that we've been talking about today are uh, critical to the implementation of the STP plan in that achieving those savings is what enables uh, Evergy to hold the rate increases to that 1.6 to 2% compound annual growth rate. That's a fair statement, isn't it? Yeah, and, and man managing the capital program appropriately, all, all those have to work in concert. Mm -hmm. Right. So... The, the ability to achieve your, the forecasted savings that we've been talking about today um, is of probably great interest to everybody to ensure that those, the rate impacts stay as low as possible. So we've talked about it in bits and pieces through various uh, questions uh, throughout the day in terms of um, the savings to date that have been achieved through the merger and you've overachieved. And, um, you know, we, we, if we look at slide 21, that was a pretty granular look at 
um, how Evergy would go about identifying a particular area where you might achieve savings. So what I'm wondering for the public, this may or may not help them, but if you, you or John, whoever's most appropriate, could, could talk about the merger, or I'm sorry, the savings tracking mechanism you have in place in a little more granular detail to put all this together for the public in terms of what we've been doing over the past two and a half years, uh, the reporting format that uh, enables staff and CURB to, to verify and, and uh, make sure that the, the savings have been achieved that you've, you've identified. Because the STP savings just layer on top of the merger savings. I think you said that it's hard to separate the two, but it's fair to say that the tracking that has the, I'm sorry, the tracking that is currently in place will be used for the STP savings that are incremental to the current savings. So um, I just thought it might help the public who's not as informed as we are on, on the background of that mechanism uh, to be um, a little more informed on uh, the details behind it because there's an awful lot of work that goes into uh, compiling all that information in those reports. Yeah, so let me let me lay some foundation and then you might have to clarify a question and I'll see if John or, or Brandy Wells can help us. So from a merger savings perspective, you know, we had 311 different uh, savings ideas or charters when it relates to merger savings. And those were based off of 2016 uh, baseline at the time. So that's how much time has, you know, water's gone under the bridge since then. Um, we're about 40% ahead uh, year to date after, or I'm sorry, merger to date after two and a half years of the five-year period. Um, we track each of those 311 and each month we go out to our teams and have them update uh, their results. And then each quarter we go out and validate internally uh, the savings to make sure that the savings that were submitted from the business, uh, that we can validate those with some sort of calculation or invoice or what have you. Um, and then, and then we share that in a confidential version and then a public version of those results, uh, periodically with the commission. Uh, the STP savings are, uh, as we've uh, laid out are based off of 2019 actual results. Um, because it's more meaningful if you can measure against uh, a more current period of time to measure, to measure uh, savings opportunity. And, and again, we have a separate, but I would say equally detailed tracking system for the STP savings uh, that we have for the merger savings. So they're two separate systems with both very, very detailed, some 300 items in one, uh, some 200 in the other. And as you said, for the some of those items are actually one and the same because those calculations are measured against commitments that were made at separate points in time. Yeah, I think that's helpful. That's, that's what I was looking for, Greg, just something that um, the public could get their arms around of, of uh, how you, how you determine and how we evaluate the level of savings. But I think just the one additional point of clarification, those, you're, you track those savings in detail such that we know the specific areas of the savings. So generation, transmission, distribution, IT, HR, wh wherever that might be, uh, it's a very granular um, review so that we can identify where those savings are. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And then finally, we would, uh, as you indicated, you're going to be tracking these uh, moving forward. So, um, all of the stakeholders would probably have the ability to um, get additional reporting and, and um, do some due diligence work on, on uh, your achievement of the savings as you move forward through the STP. Well, that, you know, certainly at the time that we make rates, we would be glad, obviously we have to demonstrate prudency of, of those costs. Um, and we're, we're glad to, to share, you know, what, what those 230 savings are with folks in a confidential fashion. Sure. Okay. That's all I have, uh, Greg. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin, do you have anything? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to ask questions this afternoon. Um, as much as it pains me personally, I don't actually have any questions for Mr. Greenwood or Mr. Grace this afternoon. So I appreciate all the information so far and 
I do have a few questions that, um, pertaining to the financial model, but I, I think those are confidential. So we'll just save those for the confidential session. Okay. Yeah, they are. Thank you. I would ask Leo if he has any questions, Leo or Tim. I have one question, please. Um, good afternoon, Greg. Hi, Leo. In our past presentation the other couple of weeks ago. We Leo, about, excuse me. If you could turn your mic up or lean in closer, that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. It's obviously something to do with my computer. But um, in our past uh, presentation, uh, we talked about how much CapEx was attributed to distribution and the amount that's also attributed to transmission. And we also spoke to the, to the fact that, uh, you know, monitoring improvements for reliability, for example, like SADI and SAFI, those are really distribution metrics, not so much on the transmission side. So my question is, with respect to O&M savings, do you have an allocation of how much savings can be attributed to distribution and how much of the savings can be attributed to transmission operations? I recognize there's going to be some that are probably to both, but is, is there a way, have you, have you looked at that split at all? Or the transmission savings would be much smaller than the than the distribution save, savings would be much larger than the transmission savings. As far as splitting those out, I don't I don't think we we do have that split, Leo. Okay, thank you. Tim Stringer, did you have any questions? Yeah, um, I did have a question concerning Wolf Creek and the changes the O&M that's going to be occurring there. Does any of that uh, necessitate a change to the USFAR? And does the NRC have to approve any of these changes? Um, I don't believe they do. I'll, I'll double check that, Tim, and make sure that's the case. But I, I don't believe they require any of that. Okay, thank you. I think that's it for our team, Brian. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Brian, and just, Brian before you yeah. move on, uh, can I just ask Mr. Greenwood a general question related to Wolf Creek? O so, only because I let Mr. French, yes. Yeah, thank you. So as you discuss um, the savings related to doing maybe um, outages um, a little bit differently with Wolf Creek, are we um, optimizing that capital investment to the extent that we can? Yes. Um, so in terms of uh, any savings, um, you're looking at the outage, but in terms of, of the um, capital, the plant as it sits, we are making maximum use of that and um so is spp that's correct okay thank you cool that's a pretty good transition into to where we are next that we're ready for commissioner questions but before we jump into commissioner questions just wanted to give everybody a slight roadmap of where we're going um, after commissioner questions it i think to keep the confidential matters separately or separate so we don't have to um, confuse uh, things and by cutting off the YouTube feed and rejoining the YouTube feed. I think after commissioner questions, what we'll do is we will take up the 30 minute section that Evergy wanted to take um, to recap the last, the, the first work study. And then at the conclusion of that will break into confidential matters. So just to give everybody a sense of where we're going, is that uh, acceptable or makes sense to you, Mr. Greenwood? Yeah, Brian, in, in fact, all of the sections of the, the supplemental update that we haven't already discussed, like uh, capacity factors are confidential as well. So I think we can, we can handle the confidential session related to the operational efficiency topic of the day um, and then just leave the feed off and go into these supplemental answers, which are uh, confidential as well. Okay, great. Yeah. If it's all confidential, the order doesn't matter as much. So, okay. With that, I guess we'll go to commissioner questions and uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, the chair to moderate this portion. Thanks. 
Thank you, Mr. Fidoten. So um, let me begin with Commissioner, and I'm not seeing him, Commissioner Keene, if you are, if you have additional questions. I'm here. <laughs> there you I are. Have, okay. Uh, All right. no, uh, I'm going to be really easy on on you this time around, Greg, and I'm going to save all the hardball stuff for the confidential session. Um, um, if we go back to page eight, which I guess is gradually becoming one of my favorite pages. <laughs> Again, I don't know that it's necessary that we put this on the screen. Yeah. Uh, here's my question, just for clarity. If I look at the chart, which is the, all right, here we go. Page, uh, and there it is. The illustrative total retail rate composition here, the impact, if you will, on rates and customer bills, as I understand. If we look at the comparison between 18 and 24 estimated, let's look at the very bottom part of this, which has to do with capital. Yes. Uh, I take it, does this suggest that capital expenditures are working their way into rates through 2024 as a percentage of all the other variables uh, that create the arc, the part of the composite. Yeah, it, it basically shows the impact of uh, the 1.4 billion of incremental spend related to the STP of that capital investment is what causes that uplift um, in, the, in the capital investment. It also in, uh, is what allows the gray areas to be smaller, but yes. Okay, fair enough. Then uh, a follow-on question would be, and again, this may be something you want to reserve for the confidential session. If so, just tell me. Uh, can you tell us what dollar amounts um, are associated with this, with this um, CapEx portion and what the allocation is among generation, transmission, and distribution? Yeah, so we'll we'll give you uh, in the confidential session for, with the supplemental information from workshop one. We'll we had a breakout of capital investment for the STP across uh, um, generation, transmission, and distribution, but it wasn't broken out between Missouri and Kansas. And I think it was you, Commissioner Keene, that asked for that. And so I, I think that been. I think that's directly related to the question you just asked, if I understand it right, and and we'll we'll show you that here in in just a bit. Fair enough, uh, uh, Mr. Greenman. I, I appreciate so much your responsiveness to our questions as well as to all the others. I think it's uh, uh, you, you've been very nuanced and very open in your approach. I thank you for that, and that concludes my questions for the time being. Yeah. And chair, if I mind, I could, while we have this chart up, I think it was the chair that had a question on the light blue other area and what made that up. I was able to corral that during the lunch break if, if now's a good time. Yes, you anticipated my uh, question as to whether you were okay. able to find that out. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, really three main components make this up. Uh, the biggest component is probably income tax. Um, also includes property taxes. And then between 2018 and 24, 2024, we have uh, sales volume changes. So there's some revenue differences, not related to price, but related to that one half of 1% growth that happens, you know, each and every year between 18 and 24. So it's really those three components that make up the other primarily. You might not uh, appreciate my follow-up then. If, uh, what, what percentage does income tax um, <laughs> of the other, is it a, are these a third, a third, a third, or what? You know, I my intuition would tell me that income tax would be the largest piece by a fair amount, but I'm I'm using just that. And I do appreciate your question. I just don't know the answer uh, okay. off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I, uh, as I'm, we're on here and looking at this slide, I would agree that it would be helpful to have um, uh, dollar amounts. Um, and percentages for each one of these groups. I mean, the uh, chart looks um, interesting, but uh, that green area in the middle, once you raise the capital, it's, it's really kind of hard to tell how much the others adjust. So that would yeah. be um, beneficial. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the financial models that we've provided and we can, we can highlight those um, 
um, later have the details. This is meant to be illustrative so that we could stay in public session and not have be burdened by the exact data that would be confidential. Uh, but the, the models will help us get to these more precise levels. Okay, very good. Um, thank you. And um, now I'll turn to Commissioner French for additional questions. No, no questions. It's been a great discussion. I will just uh, make make the, the comment that, um, yeah, I, I think the spending piece of STP gets uh, a lot of attention. Um, and, but I think, you know, we also need to keep in mind that the spending and the savings are, are in many places related. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we shouldn't take our eye off the savings ball as well, because those, those dollars that we save um, flow through directly to customers on a dollar for dollar basis um, and, and on an ongoing uh, basis as well. So, it, I mean, just to say the spending piece is important, but the saving piece is also important. And I've really appreciated uh, the additional information on that today. So uh, no, no more questions, but it's been a great discussion. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. And, I, you know, the spending piece, I always like to uh, make myself feel better about that amount of money by uh, calling in investing in Kansas infrastructure makes me feel better than, than spending. So uh, it's, it's two, two sides of the same, same coin, but one at least <laughs> fit, feels better. Gotcha. <laughs> so um, before we um, jettison the public, just one other thing. While I was talking about the overlay of all the different things going on at one time. There's also the legislative um, Senate Bill 69 that um, the requirements of the bill was uh, a, an evaluation by two different companies on a variety of subjects. And I fully anticipate that the legislature, now that both studies are complete and we did have the uh, Evergy go back and provide um, some detail that was not there in the second study. But now that both studies are complete, I fully expect that the legislature will um, call on the company to come and explain how, um, um, how we can get to the improvements, explain the situation, that was uncovered in the reports. And basically um, the reports revolved around why are our rates here in Kansas with this company so high compared to rates in other states and with other companies. So that's another layer that factors on top of this as well. And here at the commission, we're very interested. We are a part of this. We, we have reviewed the two studies. We have some thoughts. We continue to have some questions. So that is another layer on top of this. I would say to the public, there is a lot of confidential information. And sometimes I question why does this all have to remain com confidential? But there are reasons why. And um, as we believe that if some of this can be released out into the public, absolutely, we want it to be re released and be transparent. Um, that is our responsibility of the commission to continue to review and of staff to um, ascertain whether this really is confidential information and why. But um, that is a large part of any proceeding, whether it's this workshop or a rate case. So um, for the public that has tuned in, your involvement is important. If you have comments, of course, you can always share them with us. Um, so at this point in time, I would like to remind the public and um, looking for my notes. Uh, there will be another work study, which will focus on enhanced customer experience. It's scheduled for January 20th, 2021 at 10 a.m. And again, will be um, conducted online. 
and join us if you can. There will be a fourth study in May and um, always be looking at our website for additional information. Um, our folks there are really helpful. If you have a question, um, let us know. Um, Brian, is there any other business before we jettison the public? Uh, no, Chair Duffy, we're, uh, as long as IT has let us know to, to, that the live stream uh, has been cut, we can proceed with uh, confidential matters. Okay, so to the folks out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope to see you again, and we are adjourned for the public portion of this proceeding. Thank you. And Michelle, if you'll let us know when the live stream has ended. Do you still want the recording for the confidential? We would like it to be recorded on Zoom and not um, 